Uh, my name is Obert Demery. Okay, I'll start over now that there's recording in progress. Um, my name is Obert Demery, uh, and, and uh, this is uh, my, my, my good friend Jeffrey Bell, and together we are the Battery Pack, Discharging Monthly. Um, this is the third topic that we've presented uh, uh, together like this at Battery Brunch, and um, it's the uh, next part in our Who's Doing It Right series, the Silicon Edition Part 1 of 2. Uh, in this one, we're going to be uh, reviewing some sort of general advantages and disadvantages of silicon and doing a deep dive on two companies, uh, Silinano and Amprius. Um, so kind of who, who we are. Um, so we, the main purpose of this for us is that we really want to support conversations across different players in the field of energy storage and sort of speak the unspoken of battery science, things you won't see in a lab, things a company won't discuss. And we like to try to share some non-confidential lessons learned and sort of pain points to avoid and discuss what is public and critical with a uh, uh, critical eye and, and critical thinking. Uh, one thing to just say very quickly, and I added this to the slide because we didn't have it before Jeff, is uh, everything shown in this presentation is publicly available information and the opinions expressed within are solely those of Jeff and Ober. Uh, please do not you know, sue the companies we work for. <laughs> All right, moving, moving forward. So um, th those of you that have seen our previous ones, um, this is actually new. Uh, we have a new actually like, official grading scale of how we're doing everything. So the five different things we grade people on are engineering into the box, and we will cover all of these in more detail in later slides, but engineering into the box, surviving the valley of death, tech matching, there is no silver bullet, pain points, and just do we like them? And uh, sort of from a zero to a five, we'll grade them. Um, average is two and a half. So if they get two and a half, that's still okay. And anything above that is good or better. Anything worse than that is uh, shows that, that we think there's something wrong. Okay. So um, uh, this is a previous talk we've given before, uh, Surviving the Valley of Death in much more detail on sort of um, uh, what, what that means and what the different stages are, why they're important, and what you can do to try to successfully navigate them. But the core thing that you'll see here is that basically this is how you take your product from early development through pilot, through production, into commercialization, and then you have to work your way back through the other end of becoming profitable and paying off all your investors before you're actually successful as a business. Um, there are ways to cheat this, like... Um, you know, taking billions of dollars of investor money and then not delivering and, and selling your stock before the company goes under. But uh, the, the really important things are to target a high value, low quantity applications to start, always stay in touch with your markets and cash flow is king. And Jeff, I'll let you take over for this one. So when we talk about engineering into the box, right, and we look at a lot of these companies, the questions you really have to ask yourself is if they are doing something totally revolutionary or they're doing something totally new, and this doesn't apply just to the startups, but it even applies upward, right, are they engineering into the box? And what we mean by that is, are they trying to adopt existing manufacturing practices that exist out there and get their material or their tech to fit into that? Because every layer of additional manufacturing you have to develop or engineer is an additional hurdle to actually going to a production or to an application, right? So if you can slot right into current 18650s with your materials, then that is a whole world of engineering hurt you do not have to absorb, right? So we try to look at a critical eye and say, where in the manufacturing process do we think they'll run into hiccups and have to totally reinvent new equipment that'll not only do what they want it to do, but do it at scale and volume? Which is its own and cost. separate and cost, which is its own separate challenge. So when we talk about engineering into the box, we're saying, are they going into existing practices, or are they just going left? Um, and you know, one of these routes is going to be a little bit easier than the other. Anything? What do you have to buy? Anything. Okay. And then. Oh, yeah, just one, 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 one quick comment. Um, we we do answer questions at the end, and we do also stay after. Uh, the next session and to answer questions afterwards as well. So um, we, we do try to uh, not have questions during the initial part of the presentation, just so we can cover everything. Yep. I think somebody has to, I think everyone who's mute. not talking should mute because we're getting a ton of background noise. Yeah, from um, yeah uh, it looks like that person fixed it. But yeah, any, anybody uh, who, who's not muted, please, please mute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, and, and, and if you've got questions, stick them in the chat and we will take a look and um, try to answer them as we go if, if, if yeah. they're on the topic. We have the chat running in the side and uh, we will try to be as uh, attentive as we possibly can to it. All right. Uh, so next, uh, ah, next slide. All right. Pain points. Can so I... this one is quite simply just the scale up process. We're not even talking about going from 
uh, mass production gigafactory level. We're just talking small scale, bench scale to pilot scale and the difficulty in technology transfer that a company exists, right? So if we're seeing a lot of data that's coming out of coin cells, that usually means they're at the small scale and they haven't really gone bench or pilot. So the difficulty they will have as they are perceived or selling stuff usually is a correlation of, or uh, increases exponentially as they, they show, right? So if we see a lot of single layer pouches, usually you can infer a lot of information from that about where they are in their process, where they are in their scale, and then what level of difficulty will they have to overcome, right? A simple example of this is if they're used to only producing a kg of powder a week, and now they're producing 30 kgs of powder a week, does the drying process still hold true? Does, do they need different equipment, right? What, what is the challenges that they are fighting? Um, and what is the, the issues in their process when they, these pain points occur, right? Like if you're inventing a brand new material that's really uh, exotic and has a ton of things, and we'll go over that a little bit with Scylla or Anampreus, like what are the challenges with that, right? Can you do that? over a couple million cells, right? One gigafactory produces 356 million cells a year. So can you do that, that material with how exotic it is enough times to feed one gigafactory? So like that's kind of the pain points we're talking about is a lot about um, not even if they're going into the existing process, but how much of a challenge will they have with their materials? And equipment. Yep. Okay. All right. And uh, this is this is my favorite uh, uh, graphic we have for this. But um, so matching technology to market, debunking the silver bullet. We spoke a little bit about this in the uh, uh, before this room and a little bit at the beginning. But basically, um, you know, chemistry uh, is really what dictates what application and what performance you're going to have. And uh, pretty much everybody goes, you know, aha, we've succeeded. We have the best battery in the world. Everybody invest in us, the problem is solved. And the answer is, well, you might've solved one of the many problems or a specific version of one of the many problems, but um, you, there is no battery, there is no chemistry that will solve all of them. Uh, all of the different requirements of, an app, of every application at the cost of every application, it just simply doesn't exist. So um, uh, the, the, the presentation we've given on this before, we, we discussed basically how a battery in a Tesla and the battery in a soldier's remote telecommunications pack in the middle of the uh, Afghanistan desert are completely different, have very different metrics, very different requirements and extremely different costs. Like one um, example, right, of that, and just to be quick, is in a Tesla, you have a great climate control system. So you don't need to worry about heat as much as you do on a soldier who may be throwing this against a rock, leaving it out in the blazing sun. So there's completely different safety requirements, right? One car is not getting shot at, one soldier could be. Right, so there's completely different requirements for those set of energy storage devices. Okay, all right, and this is uh, also something a little bit new, and you'll you'll recognize the uh, ten ways to fool the uh, the masses uh, at the bottom. Um, so, really, what they said in that article, which is why I've been sharing it so much, is I just re we really like it because it really covers a lot of the stuff that we actually see as valuable or or dishonest really when we, when, we, when we analyze companies. And so do they have valid cell cycling conditions or are they babying the cell in perfect temperatures and pressure and, and you know, things like that? Um, how overhyping are they doing for, for their marketing? Are they saying that we're the silver bullet that will solve everything? Or are they saying, hey, we have a great new battery for XYZ application because of XYZ reasons? And we like the second, we don't like the first. Um, are they reproducible? Do they have thousand cell data sets? Or do they have you know, three different batches with one hero cell that they tout as the performance of their company? Um, uh, do they use uh, only this is and this is probably the one of the biggest ones for us. Do they actually use tested proven chemical reactions in the cells on a tester for their energy density, not spreadsheet math, because everybody can do spreadsheet math and you never get that when you actually build the cell. Um, not quietly changing procedures layout and material compositions on people as you move along, um, which basically can drastically change, you know, the conditions of your um, your, your your cell and its performance. Uh, do they play games with the loadings and ratios between different sets of data, which makes it uh, basically you can't compare the different sets of data then? 
Um, one big one also for me is that they uh, pe people oftentimes will quote costs only as in the raw materials, not the equipment, labor setup, taxes, shipping, uh, proximity to materials, and the big one is energy requirements because those can be huge. The difference between a you know on a two or three percent margin industry and batteries oftentimes are a zero margin product. If you're paying three times the electricity of somebody else, you're out of business. Um, and then uh, uh, are people comparing their results against uh, you know twenty year old data? Uh, that was state of the art back in like 2000, 2005, and then declaring, aha, we've achieved victory. Well, those guys have been doing stuff too, and they've had a, you know, three to 5% improvement or more every year since then. And so if you're comparing against old data, your stuff is already obsolete because they're already way past it. And then uh, the, the last one is basically uh, how many pretty pictures and projections of potential spreadsheet math, multi-layer stacks uh, are, are you talking about versus having built the cells and, and actually uh, shown data yourself? Anything else to add, Jeff? No, I think you covered it all really well. Let's get into the meat of it. Okay. So the uh, first two companies we're going to be covering in this, and there'll be two more at the next session. Um, but the two for this one are Scylla Nanotechnologies and Amprius Technologies. Uh, in some ways, they're very similar, and, and but, but there are some very key differences that we'll be going over in detail. They are both fundamentally uh, material companies and material for silicon. Uh, Scylla is a silo nano composite material company. Amprius is a silicon nanowire. Uh, basically, they both have the same value proposition. They're both pitching that silicon, uh, which we'll, we'll go over a little bit more in detail later, uh, can be used to increase the energy density in, in lithium ion cells when you replace uh, some percentage of the graphite with some percentage of silicon. Um, and so both of them have essentially the same technology, but very different path, sorry, the same different, uh, the, same, the same material fundamentally in the same market and the same um, uh, cells that they're going into, but they have a very different pathway to get there. Anything exactly. else, Jeff? Well, yeah, and also remember that because even if you're buying an MC off the shelf, the application or the implementation of even from the same vendor across two different battery companies may result in wildly different performance based on their engineer's ability to formulate, right? Uh, a great example of this is Tesla looks into Panasonic's window every day, what they're doing in the battery production. But for some reason, Tesla isn't making their own cells yet, right? So even with that much knowledge, the tribal knowledge that has to be overcome in a lot of these processes can lead to vastly different performance, even if you buy the same cathode, even if you're getting from the same electrolyte vendor, there's, there's huge differences here. So yeah, they're both silicon, but their, their path and their engineering goals and how successful they've been with it is, is gonna be wildly different. And what they're doing as companies is also very different, and we'll yes. get to that momentarily. So uh, first, a quick refresher on silicon, and I'll leave this to you as well, Jeff. So really the big play of silicon, right, is you're getting a lot more energy because you're switching over to a conversion chemistry, right? So you're going to get about, uh, I can't do the math off my head, but stoichiometrically about 3.75 lithium for every silicon uh, molecule you have, right? So by replacing graphite, which is about 330 milliamp hours per gram, you have the potential to have a material theoretically, right? And we don't always hit theoretical. Actually, we rarely hit theoretical, uh, something in the realm of 4,200. And that's assuming you have zero oxide on the surface. None of it's oxidized, actually. And you are about as pure as you can get. And you also have the highest uh, access of all ions, right? The big downside, right? The big issue with this silicon, and you can kind of see it in the far right graph, is the, really the idea that it's basically going to destroy itself as it cycles, right? You have to deal with a lot of volume expansion. The great way to example this is if you put a water bottle in a freezer and you come back later after it's frozen, it has expanded. And the silicon uh, anode is no different, except it's doing it almost up to 300%, which means whatever solutions and material solutions that you have in place for that electrode have to be able to accommodate a delta of 300% change in volume. Um, every time it cycles, right? So if you think about that, that's why you look at a lot of these companies, the material changes they're making, they're really looking at making these hollow structures, right? Because they're trying to create volume within the particle itself for which this expansion can go into. Because if you let it expand outward, you'll break your electrode network, your conductive additives may no longer touch the same way. Um, you'll release and you have SEI that's going to generate because you've started pummeling things around it, exposing fresh surfaces. You'll get electrolyte consumption as a result, impedance buildup as a result. Um, there's a lot of issues here. And as a frame of reference, right, guys, graphite's like 10%, right? And 
So going from 10 to 300% delta in mechanical changes, that's, that's a big technical challenge, right? And you have to think about it not only from the sense of, can you build this stuff, right? Uh, when you make a material like this, how well can you disperse it, right? Because if you get two silicon particles next to each other, even if you've done a great amount of engineering, that'll be the end of you. So even then slurry engineering becomes a huge play. Electrode architecture becomes a huge issue. So the real benefit here is you're gonna get a bit more volumetric energy density. You're gonna get a bit more gravimetric energy density, uh, but you're gonna have to deal with a lot of engineering hurdles on the anode. Um, and it's also fair to note guys that remember silicon has a slightly higher nominal voltage than graphite, which will hurt your watt hours per kg, right? You may get a benefit from the capacity standpoint, but your overall cell nominal voltage will take hit, which factors into power, right? Will the same amount in series give you the same amount of uh, power that you were originally going for, right? Can you meet the 12 volts with the same amount in series now, or do you have to suddenly add a cell or change something? Um, so that's and, kind of a refresher on silicon and the overall macro of it. Yeah. And the last two things to comment on that is, is um, you know, we, we are seeing small percentages of silicon going into industry cells currently, sort of the three to 10% is the highest I've seen on, on commercial EV cells, mostly for fast charging and a little bit more energy density. Um, but the, the big thing that you're seeing is that people are really realizing that they, they can't really do, or at least these people are realizing they can't really do majority silicon cells. So they're aiming for something more like 10 to 30% silicon, where you do have some volume expansion you have to deal with, but not 300% of the whole cell, and you're still getting a statistically significant amount of energy density for it. Um, and it's also good to note, guys, remember that uh, when they talk about 3 to 10% silicon, it's usually not pure silicon. It's usually silicon monoxide, and they're using that oxygen atom to take out a lot of the expansion. So they're not even dealing with 300 on this pure, the silicon side. They're dealing with closer to, uh, I think it's like 100 or so. Um, but yeah, so like even then, they're not even using pure silicon, which also tells you the challenge that they won't even use pure silicon in 3% ratios. They're using a silicon monoxide. Okay, so we're going to dive right into the first company. So Amprius Technologies. Um, so um, for surviving the valley of death, uh, we've given them a 3.5 out of 5, and there's a couple reasons for this. So uh, one thing they've done, which I always talk about as being really, really valuable for, for any company, but startups in particular, is they have done a really good job about getting government grants. So since their founding in 2008, they have gotten $18.2 million in government grants, and those do not include the direct military contracts. Um, for example, they actually just got one this month announced where the, uh, the Army contract them to develop 100% silicon anode lithium ion batteries using nanowires for deployment in the field. And basically the reasoning for that is that um, as long as you can deal with the safety aspect of it, every pound off a soldier's back for their kit is worth it's weight in gold to the military so they can cram more equipment on the soldier in the field. And so the batteries like that are extremely valuable and that's a great market pairing for them as long as they can deal with the safety requirements. Not only um, that, it's cycle life too, right? In a military application, guys, you have to remember cycle life, uh, the military doesn't view a soldier uh, putting something on recharge as the most effective solution, right? They're looking at ways to make sure that a soldier doesn't forget. So a lot of the time, cycle life isn't the biggest issue uh, of the military, right? So if you look at it, the Pentagon famously came out, said about 215 cycles. If you can do that before 80%, that is good enough for us. And, and some of these applications too, like uh, the um, the telecommunications kit on the back of a soldier, they'll they'll ditch the batteries in the field and grab a new one. So they only have to go one, three, five cycles sometimes. But anyway, so so since since they're um, oh I went uh, too far. Um, so they've also gotten a, a, a several different rounds of investment, and you can see the most recent one was fifty million in March of two thousand nineteen. I believe that was for their partnership scale up for their first cells in China. Um, but basically, they've done a fairly good job of consistently getting government grants and then consistently getting their next round of investment to keep doing what they're doing. And uh, one of the big things for me also is they're one of these few companies that you see that actually have a revenue so far. Usually, the time to revenue is extremely far out. It's not a lot. It's only about $3 million as of uh, 2020. And we'll see how that increases uh, as the time goes by. So the next one is engineering into the box. What we've done is taken from Amprius themselves, kind of like their cross-sectional view of their electrode and what their diagram is of their actual product, right? And the what looks like teardrops vertically aligned is, is their nanotubes, so to speak. And what you're seeing in the electrode in the very uh, 
bright region is their current collector and what you're seeing above it and below it are these nanotubes, right? So first things first, these nanotubes are great. They're aligned, they're vertically, they have certain packing efficiency that's always gonna exist. They allow for easy access of electrolyte in. They're easy to put a carbon coating on. You can easily, easily lithiate everything and you actually get to deal with a lot of the volume stress or the volume expansion stresses because of how they're oriented in the, in the fact that they're hollow. So this works actually exceptionally well, right? But, you know, the end of problem of this, right, is if you look at the current collector and you look at where they are, at least in my personal opinion, it looks like what they're doing is they're growing directly to or directly on this current collector itself. So directly on the copper. And really, if you're looking into engineering in the box, a lot of our current battery manufacturing technologies have no... Uh, direct growth systems onto the current collectors. Everything is you make a slurry out of it, you slap it on a piece of metal, and you at dry high it. speeds at, at high speeds and high volume production, and you dry it quickly, and it works as deposited. So for here, right, we're looking just from the engineering into the box standpoint. We kind of combine the two, just the engineering into the box standpoint, that they're going to have a huge challenge of putting into mass manufacturing and high volume manufacturing at that, right? The reality is that they're going to have to figure out how to grow this. Um, and of course, this is uh, based on just some images and public information, how they're going to grow this material uh, quickly. And the moment in wide, you start, in wide area in a wide area, and the moment you start changing the wide area and the quick growth, maybe your crystallinity of the silicon changes, maybe the structure changes, maybe the deposition rate changes, maybe the packing, maybe it's no longer vertical little uh, hollow silicon nanotubes, maybe they start intertangling with each other, which then completely changes how they react under expansion during lithiation. Um, you know, these are huge pain or huge issues because they do not, the equipment just doesn't exist, right? It exists in a lab, at a lab scale, and they might have scaled it up to a bench top or a pilot scale, and I don't know, but to get this into where you need to have hundreds of meters of it, every hour to supply the amount of batteries that you are going to need to supply, um, that's a challenge. That is difficult. That's difficult for anybody. Nonetheless, if you're doing direct growth uh, type methods, right? All right, next uh, next slide. And, well, I'll keep one more. Okay. Go back. Go back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then the last thing is, is the pain points. And we wrap, the reason we wrap this into it is beyond just the pain point of getting the equipment to do this at high volume and scale, it's the pain point of tuning this material and making sure it is consistent and high volume and scale. That is gonna be the biggest pain point. It's awesome that they made this. I think it's really cool. I think it's super cool. And I think that's great that they're getting into pouches and testing and showing real data, but just you know, making 10 pouches versus making 300 million pouches, right? The level of consistency and you have to have on a material basis is gonna be huge. So. You know, just as far as a pain point I can see is just the sheer scale up of this really cool nano material is going to be a nightmare, just a royal nightmare, because it's all going to be process control. Okay. Um, and the specs probably don't exist. Okay. So we, we probably have to stick to about a minute of slide if we want to finish everything going forward. So uh, J Jeff and I, uh, Jeff, actually, I think I found this and then Jeff noticed this is something we just want to point out for pain points as well. You'll notice that the um, the one C uh, charge and discharge performance is better and lasts longer at a higher uh, capacity retention than the C over three charge and discharge on this. And that is very strange. And we noticed this and we like that they shared the data. That's really, you know, it's actually a huge benefit that they shared what looks like real data uh, for their cell. But that you know, that's something kind of strange. And maybe that's something where their battery doesn't perform as well under, um, you know, lower charge and discharge, which would actually disqualify them from a lot of consumer electronics and wearables and things like that. Uh, but they are, you know, they are tech matching towards basically, you know, drones and, and aerospace and military. So maybe that's not a big problem. Yeah. But, and that's just know, something we wanted to share. One theory of that, right, and we'll just be quick on it, is that maybe at the lower rates, they use more of their silicon in there and they lithiate more of it. And then they're dealing with a higher level of volume expansion. And at 1C, that's kind of the butter zone. They don't lithiate all their silicon. They lithiate enough to get a good energy density. And they minimize volume expansion by controlling the rate which the battery sees. And that could be like one hypothesis, right? So what can go on? And then here's here's their current uh, uh, cell specs from I believe earlier this month or at least earlier this year, 
And um, so they're, they're, you know, uh, they're, they're saying, which is reasonable, that they can get 400 watt hours per kg in cells. And in production, they've announced 320 watt hours per kg in actual cells in production. And those are fairly respectable uh, for what they're doing. Yeah. And the one thing you got to caveat, though, with this, everybody, right, is that getting 400 watt hours per kg with 15 minute charging, remember, they're only increasing the capacity of the anode. They are not increasing the capacity of the cathode, right? They are using NMC. So the trade-off here, right, is in order to match a higher energy density anode and bring the whole pouch up to 400 water kg to offset all the weight you have to add, you got to run a relatively thick cathode. You got to increase cathode loading to scale as you try to push for these higher energy densities. So the probably the 15 minute charging, probably not as realistic for these. This is where, at least in my opinion, I see there's a little bit of mix and match in terms of loading. Uh, versus projected energy versus rate, right? You know, one of those situations where there were probably two cells, one was an energy cell and one was a power cell. Okay. All right. And re realistic tech uh, for their claimed application. And, and, and again, I, I said this a little bit, but, um, you know, while they have talked about aiming towards EVs, that is something they have said is far in the future with manufacturing. And really what they're doing right now is wearables, military and aerospace, where all places where their technology and silicon in general are, are good matches, right? The energy density, both gravimetric and volumetric are really key in these applications and other things are not necessarily as important. Um, and also charging time is important and that's something else that they might be able to do. So they've done a good job. Um, I think personally as well that they are really looking at what market makes sense uh, and, and wearables in the military. It's, it's fantastic, right? The, the fact that that is where they're gearing first, those are low volume, high value, high margin products, right? Especially if it's government. Government pays top dollar for watt hours. They will, or kilowatt hours, they pay the best out of anybody. So this is a really great strategy. We think they're doing this fantastically. Um, the only thing we had a gripe with is the uh, the graph they provided on the right, <laughs> where they put uh, silicon above uh, about 600 watt hours per kg and 1500 watt hours per liter. And, you know, at that point, Obear and I were like, oh, I feel like that might be a pure silicon versus pure this, NMC. What, 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 what happened here is a marketing person got hold of the theoretical calculations and ran with it, but uh, that's pretty normal in a company. So you almost expect to see that in every company to a certain extent. All right. So, and here's sort of the, uh, the meat and potatoes. So do we like them? Yes, no, maybe, and I don't know. So we graded them in all these different categories and you can kind of see our answers here. Yes, maybe, no, no. Uh, yes, maybe, yes, yes, yes. And the ones we'd like to highlight are, do they have valid cell cycling conditions? And from the data we've seen, yes. So they're cycling cells, they're cycling them at reasonable rates, you know, C over three uh, charge and discharge, one C charge and discharge, and at temperatures, 25 uh, C and 45 C. Yeah, I love the temperature one. The fact that they threw up a room temperature graph, they threw it up at rate. Now they didn't best specify pressure, which is its own bag of worms, but I'm happy that they stated at least temperature and rate, right? I would love to have seen not capacity retention and actual energy. Um, that would have been probably the biggest indicator because you could gain a lot more data from that. But I'm, I mean, we haven't seen anything that we feel is, uh, I feel like they're doing actually a pretty good job of presenting data. Okay. And one of the few things we think they still need to do and kind of overcome is we have not seen sort of reproducible, you know, thousand plus cell data sets. And as they actually go into production on the ones they've announced, I'm assuming we will eventually, but just because we haven't seen that yet, that's sort of still uh, something we'd like to, to see before we give a higher rating. Um, and uh, they've been pretty upfront about the costs and the fact that their stuff will cost more, but they're, they consider their uh, technology an enabling technology and hope that there's a premium on it over standard lithium ion, which at least in military and aerospace, there definitely is. Um, they don't compare their stuff against 20 year old crap. They compare it against stuff that's pretty standard. So that's, that's nice, we like that. And uh, while they do show pretty, pretty pictures, they have real multi-layer cells and they show the real results. So, so we're happy. So overall, we give them a three of five out of five. Yep. Going on. Actually, on to our I, next think, one. I think that actually might be a copy paste error. I think we gave them a 2.9 out of 5, and that's my bad for not catching it when we go through the slides. We'll um, find out at the end. <laughs> uh, 
I guess we should jump just for the sake of time. And then uh, after we all come back, we're more than happy to answer. Yeah, questions. so I, 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 I think we're, we're going to go really quickly through Scylla and we'll come back afterwards and, and sort of redo it a little bit slower. But basically, Scylla, again, they've been very good about getting their funding consistently. Their valuations uh, from, from a couple of years ago to just now this year are, are I think, too big, but, but impressive. And uh, they keep picking up very large government uh, uh, supports and contracts. So they just got another ten million dollars uh, this That's year for scale. Seventy, right? We found well, 70. no. Well, well, no. That's their investment. The the, yes, the, the government helped them get that 2018 70 million um, matching investment. Yeah. But um, that ten million investment they got there. They've also got a joint venture announced with D, uh, uh, BMW and Daimler. And they also have their new uh, Whoop device, where they have their cells in at twenty five percent silicon, which is uh, which is good. So we know. Like, yeah, they, they're doing it. You can just look at the red highlighted box. Like they have enough cash flow. They're getting into a product application. They're surviving the valley of death, right? Their yep. cash flow is great. They knew the market to hit and they've been talking close. One, they've been close to their markets and who they need to sell to. But two, they've also haven't like torpedoed themselves by being very public in a lot of news feeds. So they're doing a great job. Okay. And then just really quickly, again, just, you know, they've gotten a lot of, of, of funding and these are only the public ones. They've definitely gotten military and other uh, scale up money that's not showing here. So can you go the quickly, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So the, the reality is Scylla does a, a nanoparticle or a larger size silicon particle that is uh, contained in a carbon host network that is hol a hollow silicon particle in a carbon host network. Great way to think of this, guys, is a, a pomegranate. The pomegranate, uh, like skin and everything itself, is the carbon, and the seeds themselves are these hollow silicon particles. Uh, and this is their way of one protecting against uh, abundant SEI growth, making a robust background, strong uh, structure for silicon to expand in because it will expand outward a certain percent, no matter how much void space you build in the middle. Uh, controlling directional growth of a particle is exceedingly hard, especially over thousands and thousands of them, and then. On top of that, they have provided old data from about 2015, but what they are doing is they are showing, um, you know, reasonable swelling and they're showing reasonable capacity and fade. So me, the really the big pain point here is how often and how repeatably can they make this particle into what size, right? If their PSA D50 is 15, how much of a fines tail versus how much of a larger size tail, right? A D15 versus D75 do they have, right? So to me, their whole engineering in the box and pain points they're going to go right, they're perfect for engineering in the box. They slot into current systems. They'll have no trouble going into existing manufacturing equipment. It's all going to be about the pain points of material scale up. How often can they reproduce this particle? And what is this particle uh, going to be able to sustain, right? And one reason I think wearables was great is because you're not playing the rate game with wearables. It's a low current application. And part of about putting an active material inside of a carbon cage is it suddenly insulated from a lot of the ion transfer that is really beneficial towards rate. So th that's their pain points. Is it really in my eyes, it's gonna be rate and then can they produce this material consistently and is the method they're producing of this material scalable? And that's one of the biggest differences between the two companies as well when you look at Scylla versus Amprius is the, the rate capabilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are they realistic in their tech approach? We dinged them a little bit for this slide that we found in one of their recent uh, uh, white papers, the future of energy storage, where they basically talked about silicon anode is hitting everything, which I don't think it's going to hit grid. It's too expensive. Um, and I, th th I think it's going to take longer for it to be adopted at, at any significant volume in vehicles. Uh, but for the most part, they're they're matching their stuff correctly and they're, they're just doing the right thing. And again, we'll, we'll kind of cover this more later, but we have about 30 seconds left. Yeah. So, the biggest thing we think they've done that we like them for is they have not overhyped themselves. They have not overpromised. They don't give giant, you know, presentations on how great they are. They basically just go, look, we have got a cool silicon. We're making it adds these positive things. We can make it at scale. We think we can make it at cost. And here's our scale up plans done. Yeah. Like, honestly, the greatest thing they've ever done is make it so that Ober and I can't pontificate endlessly about their problems. They have done an exceedingly excellent job of keeping it close continue giving it after the uh, uh the end of the uh the community